All right, Monika Sawyer, welcome to the Happy Hustle podcast. I am super excited to connect. Yeah, me too, Carrie. Thank you so much for having me on. I've been looking forward to this. <laughs> yeah, me too. I mean, let's first and foremost just address the elephant in the room. You have one of the most bubbliest, you know, best, most charismatic personalities that I've met. Aww. And I think this is going to be an awesome interview. However, I do want to dive into just some of your amazing credentials because you are a blissful millionaire. I mean, you reached your financial freedom by turning $10,000 to over 5 million working only five to 10 hours per month with very little stress. That is happy hustling right there, my friends. <laughs> and she is now on a mission to help as many women as she can do the same and men like myself, but specifically women <laughs> in your podcaster, a best-selling author, a rock star entrepreneur. But Monica, what's something interesting about yourself that not too many people know? Mm, okay, so, well, I have traveled to 60 countries with my mm. husband just for fun in the last 27 years. So we do a lot of traveling. Um, and then the other one is that I'm a belly dancer. That's amazing do you belly dance in the countries that's the real question i don't i belly dance here but i am competitive so i've been really? all over the country yeah i am wait so you're telling me there's competitive belly dancing there is how do i yeah. not know about this I <laughs> right you should take a look around i win first what? prize frequently so really it's fun. yeah oh my yeah. goodness can we please link up a video of you winning first prize in the show notes can you send me that Have let me see if i can find one uh, they don't so they don't awesome. usually do video my husband will take okay. it but it's so bad you okay. know so but well let me see if i can find something for you that would be so awesome oh my goodness well that's hey that's definitely something interesting that not too many people know but in terms of real estate i want to dive in specifically because let's face it you're working you know less than five to ten hours per month with very little stress i mean obviously i'm sure there's some months where you got to work a little harder and some a little less and it's you know there's ebbs and flows to business but give us just a a quick backstory of how'd you get into real estate and how'd you grow this real estate empire yeah so my <laughs> My story actually begins in India before I was born. Okay, <laughs> my okay. parents, yeah, my parents came to this country as newlyweds, arranged marriage, so they barely knew each other, with two hundred dollars in their pocket. And my dad had heard that the golden ticket to wealth in the United States was to do real estate, right? Hmm. So you know they're both educated, as Indians all often are. Those of you that can't see me, I'm Indian, um, and so, <laughs> so they come over here. And they start, my mom's a doctor, my dad's an engineer, and they start saving all of their nickels and dimes so that they can buy, start buying real estate. Then I'm born and now they're like full of hope and joy. You know how it is, right? Mm. And they buy their very first rental property. So mm. that's how the whole thing started. So through my whole life, I watched my dad building this real estate business, right? And finally, when I was 18, he paid for my college education through real mm. estate. Oh, and wow. then he did the same for my sisters, right? So I really got to see how amazing real estate is. I also got to see how stressful it can be. And I know that mm. a lot of your listeners ha have heard this stuff, right? Like the calls at two o'clock in the morning because a toilet is broken or, you know, tenants not paying, not paying their rent or, you know, a light bulb's out and suddenly you're driving 200 miles for a light bulb, right? So the people, I had heard this with my dad and seen the stress. And um, so I decided at a very young age that real estate was not my thing. I am never going to do that because I understood that real estate is a long game. My dad had mm -hmm. been at my, in my whole life and there was no way in gosh darn the world that I was going to commit to something for that many years that made me miserable. I just wasn't going to do that, right? Yeah. Uh, and so um, I remember when I graduated from college, it was during a recession and I had trouble finding work. And so I was trying to kind of figure out how I was going to do this adulting thing. And I was really stressed. And one of the things that I was also committed to, and this is a cultural thing, is that 
no man was going to have to take care of me. In other words, I was not going to need a man in order to survive. I was going to be completely independent. Mm, um, amen. Indian, yeah, right? Indian women are like <laughs> married off to men and I was not going to be married off. I was going to run my life and make my choices. Love it. Um, yeah. Independent so, woman. I exactly. Like it. <laughs> so, yes. And so um, I was like, no, thank you. But dad... One night he said um, to me, you know, you know, Monica, everybody has stress and everybody has fear and everybody has money problems. Do you want poor people money problems or do you want rich people money problems? Mm. And my first thought was rich people have money problems. Like, <laughs> 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 right? <laughs> and, and once I kind of realized that, I was like, oh, I get it. I get it. And so that's why I decided to go into real estate. Cause that's how I saw like that. I was a legacy, right? I had already seen how this can mm. happen. Um, however, I was very, very committed that this journey was not going to cause me the level of stress that my dad had to suffer through. And so that's how I began my journey with a different intention, money. Yes. Less stress. Yes. Um, and so that was the Ooh. focus. And we just started by buying our own primary residence. It was super intuitive, right? My husband and I bought our primary residence from our gifts from our wedding and moved on from there. So that's kind of how the journey began. Amazing. Yeah, I love that that commitment to yourself where you just said, you know what, I'm going to A, have rich people money problems, if <laughs> if any, <laughs> you know, right. not poor people money problems, which I totally agree. You, either, either side of the spectrum, there's going to be adversity. Mm -hmm. And then I love that you also said B, which is, hey, you know, I, I want to do it right, like without stress, not, you know, in a blissful way. And and right. that's, it's a decision, you know, and, and then you set yourself up with a system that supports that decision. Exactly. So let's talk about for the happy hustlers out there who are maybe interested in investing in real estate. What is, what is like the, the number one mistake to avoid when you know, just getting into the real estate industry. To give into your fear, right? Mm. Like that's almost what I did. My life would not be what it, what, what it is if I had followed my own fear rather than sort of um, really capturing that wake up call my dad gave me. Like, thank you, dad, right? So if you're hearing me, I'm your dad. Not really, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, but like hear it, like your fear yeah will stop you from success. Um, it's there for a reason, like pay attention, but don't give it all of your attention. Make sure that you balance that with wisdom. Mm, okay. Now, I totally appreciate that. Give us an example, maybe along your journey that you used where you didn't give into your fear and you made a different decision that ended up, you know, positively changing your life. Yeah. So that was one of them, right? Was with my dad. The other one is, so he, So here's the next piece of this story is that, so my husband and I buy this house. We put 5% down. We waited, we were living in California. So it's an appreciation market. So within three or four years, it had gained a lot of equity. And so at that point, we wanted to look for another place. So I got an equity line on our primary residence. Guys, this is a strategy, so pay attention. I bought okay. an equity line on our primary residence because equity lines on primary residence are easy to get. And then I used that equity line as a down payment towards my next primary residence. Okay. And then we rented this one out. Mm. And what was really interesting is that um, my dad, so my dad's way of doing things was the way that I thought I should be doing things, even though I was committed to something different. And yes, I had all of those same nightmare stories. Like, I still had the problems with the tenants. They brought in pets when the contract said you couldn't. And there was, you know, they subleased a room when the contract said, you, like, they did all those things that I expected because of my experience, right? Mm. And that taught me a lot about what's going on inside of my own head. But before it did that, I sold the place. Like I was like, I am so not doing this, whatever. I don't care about rich people, money problems. Like I'm not doing it this way. <laughs> and, and I sold that place and regretted it like within a year. And mm. so again, overcame my fear and decided to start buying rental properties. Mm. Okay. So, and the way that I did that was I got 
a, an equity line on my primary residence and then use that as a down payment for other properties. Great tactic there. Now let's talk about someone who doesn't have a primary residence. Maybe they've just been renting for the whole, their whole life. You know, they went from college mm-hmm. and they rented and then they maybe moved rentals and, and, you know, they are ready in 2021 to pull the trigger. First and foremost, give us your market predictions. Cause I've heard a lot of people talk about, wow, right now is not the time to buy. It's a seller's market. Everything's super inflated. We've been you know, pumped, what, more capital into the economy last year than ever in the history of, you know, Mm -hmm. of our, of our government. And, and people are saying it's going to burst and it's going to, you know, the value will be devalued and, or the dollar will be devalued. What, what's your take on this 2021 market? Yeah, it's really, really hard. And, you know, this is what I say about predictions. Mm. Lots of people are making predictions and along the way, someone will be right. We just don't know who. And so for me, I just go with historical evidence. Um, I actually bought real estate in 2001 and 2008. If for any of you that went through those cycles, you realize that that was the top of the market twice. Still, I recovered. Like in 2008, I lost millions of dollars. We lost 50% of the value of our homes. Um, But, you know, you don't lose until you sell. It just Mm -hmm. feels bad, right? So you've got to kind of keep your head. That's kind of what this whole blissful thing is, is you have to have these strategies that keep you rational um, so Mm. you don't make emotional decisions. So this is a long way around to say, I don't know. And I don't know. (laughs) Because the reason is that if you're in the long game, you're going to give yourself the time to be right. And you don't need to time the market, especially Mm. with a primary residence. Here's the thing. You're going to be paying rent. So you're either going to be making you wealthy or you're going to be making a landlord wealthy. Now, a lot of people, the reason they don't want to buy a house is because they want to be able to move around. Well, that's fine. You can move around. Just rent out your place. You don't have to like sell and buy every single time you buy Mm. it then you rent it out to somebody else, get an equity line on that and buy something else if you can, right? But for Mm. my, and I know that there are a lot of gurus out there, right? That are like, your primary residence is not an asset, it's a liability. No, you're either paying rent to yourself or to somebody else. It's better if you're paying it to yourself. And you can Mm. get in on a primary residence. This is the cool thing about a primary residence that's different than a rental property, excuse me, is that the primary residence, you can get in for 3%. Mm. In a rental property, you have to put down a lot more and the interest rates are higher with the rental property. So the payments are higher, but with a primary residence, you get all the benefits you're paying rent anyways, you get tax benefits and it's a lot easier to get into. It's a lot easier way to get started. Mm. Yeah. I mean, those are great just methodologies and philosophies on the market. It's like, if you are, playing the long game, you're giving yourself the time to be right in the market. You're not mm-hmm. necessarily concerned with market fluctuations up or down or, or if it's going to crash or, or whatnot, but you're, you're in it to win it. And especially with the primary residence, you do give yourself the time to be right. And then you pay yourself rent and, and not someone else. And, you know, for me, this conversation is extremely important and timely because I've been paying others rent and now I really want to invest my hard earned dollars into my own property. And so I'm teetering with, do I buy my uh, uh, a duplex, which I've heard you need at least four doors to make money or, mm-hmm. you know, meaning like, you know, a duplex or a triplex or whatever. Um, or you can get involved in an apartment building or you buy your own primary residence and then you rent it out. Like you said, is there's just so many myths around real estate. And I think there's a myth that, you know, some are true for some and some are not, you know, it's, it's, it's very personal. And I'm just curious specifically for self-employed individuals. I know the happy hustlers out there, a lot of them are self-employed. They're entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. or they're aspiring entrepreneurs who don't get W-2s, you know, or most of them don't. Mm -hmm. And it's a different game for people who aren't getting a W-2 because you can't, you don't show income. I know me and you talked about it. Like we write everything off as entrepreneurs, you know, that's the beauty of it. Right. But then when it comes time to get a mortgage, you don't actually show the income, the net income that they're looking for. So therefore the, the loan is riskier and you have a harder time getting a, a decent rate or if a rate at all, mm-hmm. give us your 
your advice for self-employed individuals yeah. for investing in their first property? Yeah. You know, the unfortunate thing is that we can't have it all. We can't write off everything, show a loss and expect to be able to get a loan. I mean, that's just, yeah. kind of, so you have to make a choice, right? So you can either go for two years where you show a profit or here's a couple of things that, that I have recommended to people. So first, my husband is a W-2 and I show a huge loss. So for us, we put all of our loans under his name. Now, mm. a lot of banks will not do that. So we have to go to specific banks will, that will do that, which means in general, we pay about a quarter percent higher in our rate than we would if we could just go to just any bank and shop rates. We can't, but he's on the loan. We, he completely qualifies for everything. If they check my credit because it shows up with his, my credit is impeccable. So at least in that way, I'm an asset. But What's your credit? I'm curious. I'm like an 805 or something. Oh yeah, that's good. I'm yeah, 785. I'm, no, that's, I'm that, at... that's really, really good. All yeah, right. Anything over 760 is great. Okay. Um, so, but yeah, but he, you know, so, so we do everything under him and then he adds me to title later. So that's kind of been our strategy through our whole life because I always show a loss, right? So that's kind of what we do. Now, some people don't have a spouse that's W-2, right? They're just entrepreneurs. So then there's a few other ways that you can go. Right now, this is not available to people because of COVID, but normally there are no doc loans or low doc loans. These are not like the loans that were available in 2008, where you could be working at McDonald's as a cashier and say you make $300,000 a year. They will not believe you anymore, <laughs> yeah. but which is, it's to protect you from yourself. There's a reason so many people lost their shirts in 2008, right? Yep. But, but if you're the CEO of an, of, a company and you say, I make this much money, be as honest as you can, because you know what? They are really out there to help you to succeed. They're taking 80 to 97% of the risk on this, on this asset, right? They want to make sure that you succeed. They don't want to repossess a house, right? That's not what the mm -hmm. banks are in business to do. So they yep. want to make sure that you succeed and they will help you to figure out how you can succeed and your ratios are important. So when you ratios, meaning how much you spend each month, as opposed to how much you make each month. So when you fill out that paperwork, be as clear as you can in your own mind of what your ratios are and be as honest as you can, obviously on the documents. However, you know what your cash flow is. You know what you're writing off, right? So you can tell them this is actually what I make and they will, you know, investigate what, what they'll usually do is go out and they'll see how much is a person in this position, how much would they normally make? And they'll do some sort of comparison. So you mm. can get stuff like that. That's really hard to come by right now. <clears throat> Got it. But what is available right now is private money. Um, hard money is very, very expensive. So hard money, you go to an institution, they pool together money, and they take several points. Um, they, you pay a high rate between 9 to 15%, and they usually only give you six, six months to a year, and then they charge you points every single time you renew. Oh, wow. So that's an expensive way to go. However, private money is to go to people that you know and ask them if they want to invest in your property. You give them title on the deed and maybe right maybe they're making if they're in a cd they're making one and a quarter percent you offer them five or six or seven cd meaning uh like a bond people. or cd uh what do you call them certificate or... of deposit certificate of deposit okay. If they're in the stock market and they like that volatility, that's great. Um, but if they would like to have some of it that's not so volatile, they can secure it with property. So um, I never recommend going more than three or four people on a deed. Um, and you need to have some money in yourself so that they know that you've got, you know, you've got your skin in the game. But I'm noticing a lot of people, they're wanting more secure um, income on their money to have it working for them without the volatility of the markets. Um, and so that's actually a really viable way to go. Hmm. Interesting. It's like crowdfunding your house where you, right. you get some people together and you're like, Hey, you guys want to go in on this $500,000 property? I'm putting a hundred, you get everyone, that's you know, right. I get four more people who put a hundred and we're equal partners. And then 
you know, eventually maybe you buy them out at a interest rate or. Absolutely. Absolutely. When you're able to refinance out or whatever. And so, and then this kind of goes to the house hacking idea that you were talking about. So um, I used to have a house really close to Google. And so we rented out one room and one bathroom on Airbnb and we paid the entire mortgage. Mm. You do that for two years, getting a loan is going to be a little bit easier, right? Yeah. So when you talk about in order to make money, you need to have four units, maybe, but if you're living there and is paying your entire mortgage, is this, does that count as making money? I don't know, right? If you Saving do a money. duplex, <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. And everything you save is what you're making, right? So yep. for us, maybe we were saving $3,000 a month. Well, that's 3000 extra cash flow that we've got month to month, right? So when you're looking at what to buy to do a duplex, do a single family home, a lot of times I'll just say, get a single family home where you can put, you know, um, a little, it might have an extra unit in the back, or it might have its own little extra master bedroom where people can walk in from another area or something like that. You can do that too. So um, there's a lot of ways to house hack in order to either make money or, or help you to not have to pay so much for your own. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's definitely something to think about for all the happy hustlers out there who are like, wow. All right. I thought my hands were a little bit tied here. You have Monica dropping, you know, 17 different ways for you to get in the real estate <laughs> game. I mean, I don't know if you guys are, aren't taking notes. You should be, I mean, you know, I am. And, and this is, you know, why I wanted to bring her on because here she is, you know, a, a multimillionaire from real estate who has passive income streams, started from you know just humble roots doing it like getting a property herself a primary residence then getting another one how how where where's your you know real estate business at now in terms of like are you are you focusing on apartment buildings are you focusing on you know commercial are you doing residential what what's the moves next yeah. So, so I'm in an appreciation market. And so my entire focus up until now has been appreciation. I don't like to carry negative cash flow, So I do like cash flow, and we've got four or $5,000 of cash flow coming in, but it's been over time in an appreciation market. You don't start with cash flow, right? You kind of have to balance this cash flow or appreciation thing and different markets will do different things for you. So that's a decision to make when you start to really look at investing. Um, right now I'm in transition. My husband and I are kind of looking at by the time he's 60, so maybe five years, we'd like to retire, which means all of this appreciation needs to start paying the bills, right? Mm. And so now we're looking at moving into cash flow. However, I am truly an entrepreneur and I get bored just like many of you. Um, <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so I recently have moved mm. into construction. Now, what's really oh. funny about this is that so many people in the real estate market are like, this is the worst time for construction, especially because like all the costs for everything have gone up because supply chains have gone down or they've gotten mm -hmm. harder with COVID. So I got in at exactly the wrong time. <laughs> but... I bought a property, uh, uh, you know, uh, for a song and we're building it and the market that we're in, even though it has gone, you know, the prices have gone way up. Our margins are still such that I'll clear probably about a million dollars on this piece of property and Whoa. then I can invest into something else. So this one is not going to be my like goose with the golden egg, but it could mm -hmm. lead to the goose with the golden egg. The other thing is, and this is just something I want everybody to hear because it's really, really important. I am an entrepreneur. I have shiny object syndrome. So I choose another shiny, <laughs> shiny object and I go for it, right? Yeah. Always have an exit strategy and know what that is. So if we're doing the long game, like what I do with the rentals, my exit strategy was 20 years down the line, right? And now I'm kind of trying to figure that out. And because it's the long game, I've got time, right? But with, a, with construction, I'm in for two years. And if the market turns, I'm screwed. Right. This mm. happens with flipping too, or wholesaling. The market can turn in a month. It can happen so fast. So you want to make sure that you're not one of those people that only has one exit strategy. And if it doesn't work, you go bankrupt. This happened mm. a lot in 2008. And so for me, I have three exit strategies, sell, rent, or move in. Mm. Right. And so, and I am completely open to whatever I need to do to make sure that 
I don't financially pay a price for this project that I got into at the wrong time, right? Mm. So this is another one of those things, like how do you protect yourself when you think the markets might turn? Protect yourself by, first of all, don't over leverage. I'm at 80% um, CLTV, CLTV, combined loan to value. My, my debt, <laughs> yes, my debt is only 80% of the value of the property. So it can still drop 20% and I'm not underwater. But if it does drop more than that, and usually corrections will not, 2008 was an interesting, weird thing. It is not the way things normally go. Usually a market will go you know, 20% max. If it goes down to there, I'm not underwater. But even if I am underwater, I can move in. I can take rent on the other pieces of it and hold it until I'm right again, and then I can mm. sell it, right? So just when you're, when, you're, <laughs> when you're doing the exciting new things, make yeah. sure you give yourself the time to be right. And part of that is, is having several different exit strategies. Is that yeah, too much? And, and, no, I think that was great. <laughs> I mean, I'm following. I hope the happy hustlers are too, because these are, you know, this is a, a real straight expert, someone who has really you know, become not only an expert for herself, but you're a thought leader in the space. You have uh, the real estate investing podcast for women, you know, like you wrote yeah. books on this, you know, this is something that I, I think all the happy hustlers out there really should, I mean, be, you know, listening to intently because this is the difference between wealth and, you know, just barely getting by. I mean, what do they say? There's three ways to really, you know, accrue wealth in this country or, or in the world and in real estate, you know, investing in the stock market and then starting a business. And starting most of the happy business. hustlers are starting a business, mm -hmm. but why not use that, those profits to invest All in real three. estate? You know, yes. exactly. Can I, and you know what, can I speak to that a little bit, Karen? Sure. Um, so I started my real estate business when I was 25 and I had no love for real estate as you heard. <laughs> but I was an entrepreneur with a lot of excitement and a lot of ideas. And so I started my real estate thing. I bought a house, right? That was our big commitment. Spent no time, right? When I rented it out, spent very little time. And my whole life was about my new, exciting entrepreneurial adventure. Now, I will say I was a successful entrepreneur. I would make a quarter of a million dollars a year or whatever it was, but not consistently, right? Mm. And, and for so many people, the plan for an entrepreneur is I will build up my business enough that hopefully it will take care of me when I retire. Well, hope is not a plan, mm. okay? So I had all my time and energy and money going into my entrepreneurial pursuits, but my side hustle was this real estate business. I will say this, in the end, it's the real estate business that's going to retire me. It's the entrepreneurial endeavors that gave me the fun and the excitement. And certainly they paid for some nice trips and whatever. And, and in good years, they even paid for lifestyle. In bad years, they didn't. Hmm. They took my lifestyle, right? So in the end, it was this crazy little side hustle that I paid no attention to that will retire us. So it's just something to keep in mind if you're an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, hopefully you will be super, super uh, um, successful, but hope is not a plan. Mm. Pr plan for success for yourself so that you're not working when you're 80, unless you want to be. If you want to be, yay, but yeah. make it so that you don't have to. Yeah, yes, yeah, so true. I mean, that was just some some wise wisdom right there, Monica. <laughs> and I really appreciate that. I mean, it, hope is not a plan. And, and you have to really take stock where you're at, be realistic. There's ups and downs in business. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of times it's out of you know, our control, our control you yeah. know, like I really do believe, like I take accountability for my reality always. But with that being said, some things happen like the pandemic, you know, and, and who could have predicted that? Right. Yeah. 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 It, so. It's a great point. You have to really hedge your bets. You have to think about your strategy for the long term. So you're and not, you know, working when you're 80, unless you want to be. Unless you want to be. And, you know, it's also really interesting. And, and I, you know, I, I hesitate to say this, and I've never said this on a show before, but it's a reality and it's an ugly reality, but it's the truth. Those of us in the pandemic that had real estate and were in the stock market, we have taken our lives to the next level. 
Well, mm. all the other businesses are, are in pain. They're getting loans. They're shut down. Those of us in real estate are flying high. I mean, I will say I've met my retirement number already. And that wow. happened during the pandemic. Wow. I was close, right? But the final numbers came during the pandemic. So just think about it. And you guys, please don't, you know, shoot knives of envy or anger to me. I'm just yeah. trying to give you perspective on you can set yourself up for this too. This is, and yeah. real estate in the United States is available to everybody. The government has set it up that way. They want you to have real estate. This is not a strategy for the rich. This is a strategy from the very, for the very poor all the way to the very rich. It's the entire spectrum and you have access to that. So set yourself up because things yeah. happen. And yep. when the economy goes bad and the real estate people are hit, just make sure that you're not over leveraged, that you can rent out your places and, and ride the storm until it's over. Mm. But real estate gives you access to all of that stuff. And I can't, I can't emphasize it more than right now through this experience because I've seen how much pain there is. Now, I personally have suffered a lot of loss you know, family, family members have died. There's been a lot of yucky things that have happened in my life because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But money is not one of those things we are completely taken care of. And as a matter of fact, at some point I needed 10 days to grieve and I could just walk away from the business and it kept giving me money. Mm. So, so set yourself up for success. And this is one of those things. It's like, it's like your, you know, your security bond. Like, what can I do that's going to save me if something happens and my business, is, it doesn't do what I was hoping it would do or expecting mm. it to do, right? Yeah. Wow. I mean, that's so true. And you have to just look at, too, history repeats itself. Everything's cyclical. There will be another there will pandemic be. in some capacity and, and a market crash. And are you going to be prepared next time? or not? Are you going to be the one in pain? Or are you going to be the one riding high like Monica, who just mm -hmm. hit her retirement number <laughs> throughout this, you know, throughout this pandemic? I mean, what, what, what do they say? More millionaires are started or are, are created in downturns in the market than ever before. And you just have to set yourself up. Yeah. Exactly. And, yeah. and don't feel bad if you're, if you're, you know, too late now, know that it's going to happen again in the future. And you can be prepared. You could start now saving, you know, investing wisely, looking at some of these alternatives that Monica said. I mean, it, it's definitely got my attention. I know. And I, I hope to have the hustlers as well. Now, Monica, I want to ask you, what was your first hustle? I ask all my guests this. I'm curious what <laughs> yours was. What was the first thing you did for money? Uh, my first hustle. Um Ooh, I don't even remember what my first hustle was. <laughs> um, I know. So some of the hustles I've done though, is I did ran an import business um, and, so, and for gift back in the day when like gift shops were a big thing um, and sold these little, um, I don't, you guys probably saw these, these little Egyptian perfume bottles. Do you remember okay, those? Okay. They were everywhere. I was one of the wholesalers for that, bringing them in from Egypt. Um, I was a day trader on the stock market for a while. Um, well. That actually gave us so much money we shut down everything and went for a trip around the world um and so those are my two big ones those are the big successful ones i don't even remember what the first one was so long ago <laughs> oh geez yeah i mean it's always funny to think about you know like when we were kids what, what we were doing and you know it, it's a uh... It's a walk down memory lane when you it when is, you get it. it. I'm curious what it is. I'm not gonna let you off the hook. I'm gonna find yeah, out one of these I'm, days I'm what you did. Too. What did I do when <laughs> I was a kid? I don't even remember. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. But let's talk about entrepreneurship because I know you're an entrepreneur. You also, in in addition to real estate, I mean, you have like a full on business. Talk to us about your business and and you know maybe your greatest lesson from entrepreneurship. Yeah. So my business is my podcast. So I have a podcast called Real Estate Investing for Women. Um, when you start a podcast, and, and Carrie, you can speak to this better than I can. Um, so I'd love your input on this because I could use some advice. Um, <laughs> is that so my podcast is my business. And usually when you start a podcast, you're told that it is a marketing channel towards something else, right? You, you have this podcast and then you sell 
something else. Well, I didn't want to sell anything else. I've been a coach for 15 years, I'm now 20, and I'm over it. Like I want more freedom. I don't want all these things on my schedule. I, you know, I'm kind of moving in a different direction in my life. And as much as I love helping people, it is my true passion. The one-on-ones on the phone, um, weren't filling me up anymore. And even the group calls, I would find that, you know, if I'm in Thailand or something, I'd have this group call and I couldn't really perform. And then it just makes me feel bad. Right. Mm. So, so my life is changing. And so my availability is different. And what I want to do with my life is different. Having online courses, I haven't had any success with that. Um, maybe I haven't found the right coach, but I'll tell you, I've tried a lot. Um, and so I'm kind of <laughs> like, I don't know, like, is that the thing for me? So here we are with this podcast that I love to do. I'm a media. I love media. Like you can kind of tell, right. Yep. Um, and so the podcast is the business. Well, here's the thing. Making money on a podcast is really, really hard. Do you find this experience too? If it's just the podcast. Yeah. I don't think it's that hard to be honest with you. Maybe so it's counter to, yeah, let's talk. <laughs> Let's yeah, talk. You, <laughs> but I mean, you, so you were good. in a podcast and mastermind for a little bit. Everyone in there is making money from their podcasts. So, but all of you them know. had courses when I was in the mastermind. All of them had courses or did coaching, and that's what I'm saying is I'm not willing to do those things. Oh yeah, yeah. So for I have a couple strategies, and this goes for everyone out there listening. If if you do want to, you know, do a podcast, um, there's ways to monetize it without actually selling your time for money. Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm a big proponent of leveraging your time. And I, I got out of the coaching business because I could see how you just basically trade your time for money. Yes. Maybe the, the, the value increases and you're making more for your time, but at the end of the day, you only have so much time and you have <laughs> you no know? leverage. And as real exactly. estate people, we like leverage, right? Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So you and I need to have a talk about that, Carrie. But yeah. in the meantime, where I'm at is mm -hmm. I, um, the podcast is doing exceptionally well. So I do have sponsors. We do do some affiliate links. I'm, e I'm making a little bit of money from the podcast, yeah. um, which is great. And what that means is that I've got all my money coming in from real estate. My husband's W2 and I can now do the thing that I love and yep. which is sharing my wisdom so that people can then find their own freedom. Right. So, mm. so that's my business right now. And all the things around that, like every week, something breaks on the, on the, my website or there's like, <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, production again. Really? Like there's, there's yeah. all this stuff that we're doing. And so that's the thing that now takes 20 to 30 hours a week. Right. Um, but the business that's making me money is still my real estate. And you know what, in a way that's a point of, of pride for me because so many people mm -hmm. that teach real estate are making more money in the teaching than they are in their real estate. And I'm mm. teaching real estate from a place of my real estate business is very, very successful and takes very little time. Yeah. Yeah. You, it's, it's, it's very true. Indeed. Like a lot of people now you see it for sure. Those who cannot do our teachers <laughs> and That's they right. like, and it's sad because there's so many gurus out there and, and get rich quick schemes and everyone's got the next biggest thing. And it's really tough to, you know, decide who you're actually going to listen to, who you're going to follow because everyone's putting their best self on Instagram and this facade, you know, mm -hmm. of, you know, what life they, looks like this. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, so many people teaching about real. freedom are completely are working 70 hours a week, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's like, they're like, Oh, I'm going to go on vacation and work. Why would you go on vacation and work when I'm on vacation? I want to be on vacation. I don't want to be on a beach with my laptop on vacation. Okay. Maybe if that's how I live yep. my entire life, but not on vacation, like then I'm yep. just working in a different place. Like that is yep. not freedom to me. To me, freedom is what I have when I'm on vacation. I'm on vacation. Nobody gets to talk to yep. me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Well, except my yeah. husband. But <laughs> well, and and it's a good point. Yeah. Hopefully he gets to talk to you. But you know, <laughs> the truth is though, that's why I even started the happy hustle. You know, it, it's because I knew there was a better way. Like I've tried it the other way where I invest a hundred plus hours each week into my business and and I I'm basically sacrificing my faith, my family, my fun, my fitness mm -hmm. for what? For this profit mm -hmm. and success. And I burn out. And you will too if you're doing that. If mm -hmm. if if you just go all in on your business and focus nonstop on it. And and so when I burn out, I realize, whoa, there's more to life than 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 hustling. 
I want a happy hustle. I want to be, you know, waking up every day with hmm, a little bit of work, a little bit of play. <laughs> then I get to enjoy my day. You know, yeah. it's like the balance. That's mm -hmm. what equals happiness. And I will go to my grave holding the flag. And, uh, you know, it's true. It's like, I've now seen it in my own life. I've seen it with thousands of other happy hustlers when they can get clear. And that's why I have the 10 alignments to really iron everyone's, you know, schedule into these very clear buckets, 10 mm -hmm. alignments. You just focus on each of those in their own right. And you just quantify where you rank. And, mm -hmm. you know, for those people who haven't already, I highly recommend going to carryjack.com, taking the quiz, you yes. know, it's, 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 60 seconds and it tells you where you're out of balance right now. So you don't burn out. So you can go on vacation and, and just go on vacation like Monica and enjoy yourself in your life. And that's what it's all about. <laughs> it's so funny. I actually heard, um, we actually heard, overheard a conversation um, of two tables behind us when we were on vacation in Florida. Um, and one guy was sitting there and he's talking on the phone. He goes, yeah, I'm on vacation. I'm at a Starbucks. I thought I'd log in and, and check out, you know, what's going on. There was obviously a fire he was trying to put out. Mm. And then there was another woman behind, talking to her husband. He's like, oh, I feel so bad that that guy can't even walk away from his business when he's on vacation. And these people overheard. And when they left, these people said, well, I'm so sorry that they hate their business so much that they don't want to do it on vacation. Oh, so it's so it's so interesting because David and I are listening to this. Yeah, like, yeah. Wow, such different perspectives. But here's what I will say about that. Yes, love your business. Love it to pieces. That's how it's going to be successful. Also, love your life. Mm. You can love your business. Don't take it with you on vacation because your life requires vacation, your sanity, your romance, your health. All of those things require you to have some off time. So don't just love your business so much that it goes with you everywhere. Your mm. business will leave you. Hopefully your spouse will not or your children. Yeah. Mm. Sure Preach it. that you're, you're like, your priorities are set right. You have to love your life at least as much as you love your business. Yeah, so true. And, and you have to really be honest with yourself. If you, right now you're not where you want to be, you don't love your life, that's okay. We've all had to, you know, I say shovel shit for lack of a better we term do. to it's get true. to where we want. We got to earn the right to do what we love. Like you have to, there's, there's no shortcuts oh, to success. Yes. You, you really have to earn the right to do what you love. And uh, this is coming from the guy who wore the the banana suit outside of a smoothie <laughs> shop for a while. Okay, so uh, yes. I did not love that. You know, yeah. uh, it's quite embarrassing. But now I'm at a place where I can go fly fishing on a Tuesday. I can go snowboarding on a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. I can do my martial arts, you know, on weekends and without you know regret free. You know, and mm -hmm. like I unplug. I don't have all the answers and I don't claim to be. And Monica doesn't even have all the answers. No. She doesn't claim to be. But we're figuring out our version of happiness, and we find within the happiness that we enjoy even the hustle because there's that balance, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you, you have to just take stock in what it is for you. So this has been amazing, you know, Monique. And I just, I love that we got on that tangent because I, anytime balance comes up, I'm all for it. <laughs> yes, I know. I, I can tell the happy hustle. That's what it's about. <laughs> yep. You nailed it. Yeah. Now, now Monica, I want to get into what I like to call happy hustle hacks. And okay. these are basically shortcuts, you know, something that you've used or a tactic or tool or tip that you use in a couple different disciplines that really could add value to the happy hustlers out there listening and watching. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to start first with health because, you know, we, we've alluded to it, but it, it really is health equals wealth. If you don't have your health, your real estate business, your, your podcast, nothing matters. You know, nothing if you're not matters, that's if, true. If you're not like, if your temple is not taken care of. So what is a happy hustle hack for your health that you can share? I'm a dancer. So, and this is the thing, right? Like you, so many people are like, I'm going to go work out, but willpower will not drive you on those down days. So find something that you love to do to work out that not only is good for your health, but that actually adds to the joy of your life. So when you're having a bad day, that's the thing you want to do, not that's the thing you want to skip. So mm. find something that you love to do that works your body physically 
that is actually the joy of your day. It's the thing that lifts you up and create, helps you be more creative. And on your bad day, that's the only thing you actually want to do mm. rather than the opposite, which is what most people, how most people approach working out. Ah, so, so beautifully said. I mean, I think of soccer when you think of that. I played soccer my whole life. And, you know, even now I still play like aggressive indoor soccer and then, and then, you know, outdoor when, when the weather permits, but that is the highlight of my day, you know, yeah, even if it's yeah. a rough day and you're That's just, true. yours is dancing. So I yeah. love that. So cool. Let's talk about money. And we've talked about it in the, in, in terms of real estate, but I want to hear a happy hustle hack for money that you can share something that's, you know, maybe helped you save, invest, or spend your money wisely. What, what's a, a happy hustle hack there? Um, God, there's a lot of them, but, th but the <laughs> yeah. one that's coming to me for your group is diversification. Um, it's kind of like what you said about there's three ways to make money in the United States or this, and this is what the rich do. They invest in their business, they invest in real estate, and they invest in the stock market. So just diversify. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. And as entrepreneurs, we're so tempted to do that, right? All of our money goes into the business. All, you know, like just understand that some level of diversification, you could put all your money into your business and maybe 10% somewhere else. And, and that split up is 5% in the stock market and 5% into real estate. I mean, you could do that by paying rent to yourself. There's a good start. House hacking is another one, right? You, but you want to you wanna make sure that everything doesn't go into one basket. Now, focus goes into one basket. Your business requires your focus, but your money doesn't have to all go there. Mm, yeah. Diversification. Huge. I mean, I think about even just my own like portfolio. I'm, I'm now really making real estate a priority, but like even I just bought some crypto and, and, you know, like I don't care if I lose it. I hope I don't, but it's like, if it blows up great. You know, I bought yeah. a bunch of random one-offs that I, I did some research on. And then I have my stocks and my IRA and, you know, and then you have your business that you're investing in. It, it, it's it's very important to diversify. So that's a great happy hustle hack there. Yeah. Let's talk about spirituality. You know, I, I believe in God. I mean, not one God or another. I, I believe in a higher power, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I think it's important to have faith. What's a happy hustle hack for your spirituality that you can share? Meditate. I'm sure you hear this all the time. Yeah. But, but I just want to give a little bit of a twist to this. So I am, I have a monkey mind as do many entrepreneurs and we hear yep. about this, right? You have to meditate and an entrepreneur sits down and goes, oh my God, I can't like, they're thinking about all right. They're, it's really hard to get the monkey mind to slow down. And so it doesn't happen often very early on. And so then people are like, give up on it. This doesn't work for me. I don't know what they're talking about, but understand that all the really successful entrepreneurs had some kind of meditation practice way before this was popular. They didn't call it meditation. Yeah. They called <laughs> it their, their own personal mind time or what, you know, whatever they called it. Right. I don't yep. even remember what they called it and think you grow rich, but it was there. Right. So since the beginning of time, so you need time for your mind to slow down. But if you're an entrepreneur and it's not working, this is how I do it when it's not working. I do a moving meditation. And this is what this mm. looks like. Either I'm dancing or I'm going for a walk. But what happens is I slow my mind down enough that I feel every time my heel hits the floor and the way my, my foot rolls. I can feel the breeze on my skin. I can hear the music of a dancing, I can hear the music going into my body and just feel that rhythm, right? So whatever it is, if you're going for a walk, you know, you want to feel your arms sway. You want to be looking straight ahead and noticing the beautiful greenery. Like just slow down your mind and be present enough that you're not thinking about all those other things that you should be doing. You're thinking mm. about the exact present moment and what's going on and all the sensations around that. So you can't do it with soccer, but you can do it with these things <laughs> yeah. that you can do a little bit more slowly. And a walk is a really good way mm -hmm. to get some exercise and also do a moving meditation. And it shuts down the monkey mind just long enough for you to benefit from meditation. Once you get used to slowing down the mind, 
now you can go into a real meditation practice. It takes time. All of this, anything worth having takes time, guys. Yeah. So if you want this, you want to have the creativity and all the benefits that it offers your business, you could start with this and then move to a meditation practice that is where you're actually slowing down your breath, focusing on that. So the creativity really comes in. Movement does help with creativity too. So you could do it either way. Yeah, love that. I mean, I, I do Qigong and Tai Chi as yes. my form of movie meditation. And, mm -hmm. and you know, that is for someone who is hyperactive, it always mm -hmm. got the monkey mind and wants to, you know, go, go, go. That's a great way to move and be still in a paradoxical way, you know, yeah, every morning. It's true. You know? yeah. yeah. So great, great tip there. Love it. Monica, where can people go to find out more about you? And, you know, I know you have something special for the happy hustlers. Why don't you give us some links? Yeah. So just go to blissfulinvestor.com. You'll find everything there. So there's a download that tells my story of how I started from 10,000. It's the story up to 2 million. And you kind of see like what I did in 2001, what I did in 2008. And you can look at that and say, wow, I could do better. And you can... <laughs> <laughs> and you can take you can take it from there. So that download is available to all of you if you want to add real estate into your diversification. Um, that's available. My podcast is there, Real Estate Investing for Women, and all of my books are there. So you can find everything about me at blissfulinvestor.com. Love it. Blissfulinvestor.com. I got guys, I would say definitely read and and first of all, download, but then de definitely read that, you know, awesome <laughs> like outline of her life, which step by steps walks you through what to do. I mean, if you want success, reverse engineer those who have it. It's there you so go. True. She did it for you. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I did. There's yeah. no lies. I will tell you, I'm yeah. completely transparent. So Oh, that's amazing. I love it. Now, I want to ask you a couple questions in the rapid fire round. This is basically where we just dive in to random topics and you answer honestly, first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready, Monica? I am ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Favorite movie, go. Dirty Dancing. <laughs> Ooh, favorite food. Uh, French food. Ooh, favorite book. Um... Oh, so many. I would say the one thing. Mm, I love it. What is your spirit animal? A duck. <laughs> A duck. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. Never heard that. Best business advice. Stick with it. Don't ever oh, give up on it. yourself. Love it. If you could have a superpower, what would it be? Kindness. Mm. One billboard that just shared your last message, your last piece of content with the world, what would that billboard say? Always remember that bliss is your birthright. Choose mm. to live your bliss every single day. Oh, love that. One word you'd wish to be synonymous with your name for the rest of your life. Bliss. Mm, love it. And three things you're most grateful for. I'm grateful for my husband. I'm grateful for my life and I'm grateful for my business. Mm, awesome. You crushed that rapid fire round, Monica. And I just want to take a moment to acknowledge you for sharing your love, your light, your bliss with the happy hustlers. This has been amazing. I so appreciate you. Any final thoughts or, or words or, or take homes that you want to drive home to the happy hustlers before I ask you the final question? Yes. Goals without action are just dreams. So get out there, take action so you can create the life your heart deeply desires. Mm, boom, love that. Now, final question. What does happy hustling mean to you, Monica? It just means running your business in a way that keeps your life blissful. Mm, mic drop, love it. Monica Sawyer, everyone. Thanks for watching and listening. We out, peace and love.